Well, good morning, Midway Church. And uh, good morning to those of you who are at home joining us online. Thank you every week for those of you who make an effort to intentionally be here, whether online or uh, at home. Kyle, come on over here for a second. Uh, I just wanted to pause for a second. None of us get to where we are alone. Uh, I often say that relationships are so key because every great experience in life that we have involves somebody else. Every great dream we're ever going to experience involves somebody else. And every great accomplishment we ever have always involves somebody else. And I have an amazing team of people here at Midway Church that I've been able to serve with over the years. And one of those guys celebrates eight years as a part of our uh, leadership team here at Midway Church. Kyle, is, uh, this is his anniversary, so I just want to say I love you, brother, and grateful for all God uh, has uh, used you to do here at Midway Church. Look forward to the years ahead, and someday I, when I get to heaven, I'll have hair like yours. All right, God bless. All right. You glad you're alive? Say, I am. All right. Well, open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John, toward the back portion of your Bible. If you don't know where that is, just go to the book of the Revelation, which is your last book in the Bible, and then turn left and go a few pages. You'll come to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I want to thank you for uh, either being here in person or joining in online with your Bibles and making an intentional effort to to worship. And I've got something going on here I'll try to fix. Um, And we are constantly here. That's where it is right there, isn't it? I found it. Let's see if that helps. I don't know. We'll see. Um, But making an intentional effort to worship, to learn, Uh, to make sure that your journey in the future is better than your journey in the past. And that doesn't happen by accident. If you don't intentionally invest in yourself and invest in your spiritual journey, don't expect good and better to chase you down. It's never going to chase you down. Bad and worse will always chase you down. You do know that, don't you? Bad and worse will always chase you down. It's always lurking nearby, but good and better never chase you down. You're going to have to chase after it, and that means you've got to do the right stuff consistently every day, every week, every month, every year for a lifetime until you take your last breath. You never can put it on cruise control. So we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1, and we're beginning this new series, and if you will, if you will do something that I want to ask you to do, it will help you personally, it will help your family, it will help us as a church and as a community get better consistently through this journey over the several weeks. I think we're going to be studying this book for probably 12, 13 weeks, and, and I want to ask you to do something on Mondays, every Monday, as long as we're studying this book. I want to ask you to read chapter 1 on Mondays. That's going to take you probably about seven minutes Did you get that? About seven minutes. I'm going to ask you to read chapter 1 on Mondays. That means tomorrow and a week from tomorrow and two weeks from tomorrow and three weeks from tomorrow and four weeks from tomorrow and I think five weeks from tomorrow. So you're going to read 1 John chapter 1 every Monday. You with me? Say, I am. All right. I'm going to ask you to do on Tuesdays, I'm going to ask you to read chapter. Boy, y'all are geniuses, I'm telling you. Chapter 2 on Tuesdays, and so every Tuesday, get up and read chapter 2. And here's what that's going to do also. It unifies us as a body of believers reading the Word of God together as we study this together, and it's going to prepare you for when we get to those passages, just automatically you're going to begin to see things you've never seen in the Word of God if you'll do this. And then on Wednesdays, you're going to read chapter 3, and you're going to read chapter 4 on Thursdays and chapter 5 on Fridays and there's only five chapters and so you can be sort of off and do something different on Saturday and Sunday and come in and let's study together uh, as a family of God on Sundays and so you're going to read those chapters every week if, if, you, if you're in for that say I am all right. Now, I know not everybody can say I am, and not everybody's going to do it every day. Sometimes you're going to slip, but I'm going to ask you, try to make a commitment to do that. So Monday's chapter 1, Tuesday chapter 2, and right on down the line through Friday of chapter 5. Now, if you haven't already, open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. 
As we begin this book, I want to give you a little understanding and lay some groundwork and foundational principles as to how to understand this book as we are teaching together because all of our teaching pastors will participate in teaching some portion of this book. But there are some guiding principles or what I would use as keys to understanding and unlocking this particular book. And there's, uh, there's really two overarching themes, and we've titled the series this concept just simply... Uh, light and love, light and love, be the light, show the love, God is light, God is love, and both of those phrases are in this passage, in chapter 1 and verse 5, it says God is light, and in him there is no darkness, that's another way of saying that God is truth, and in him there is no deception, in addition to light, he says in chapter 4 and verse Eight, he says, God is love. And then verse 11, and if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. So uh, an overarching theme for this entire book is God is light, God is love. And he has passed that on to you and me as followers of Jesus Christ and recipients of the grace of God and as a part of the family of God. So in the world in which you and I are living in, we are to be light and we are to show love because we are connected to the family of God and God is light and God is love, then we are the ones who can carry that out in the world in which you and I live. Make sense? Now, in addition to that, there are, there, there are some phrases you're going to notice over and over. You won't read very far in these chapters till you start noticing some of these phrases. One of those phrases is this. I am writing, John says over and over again. I am writing to you or I have written to you. And he's talking specifically in this book. I have written or I am writing. And he's saying I am writing because of this or I have written because of this. He's trying to explain to us why this book is written. Now, there's about 10 times you're going to notice I have written or I am writing. You're going to about 10 times. Four of those pretty much summarize all 10 In four of them, here's what he says, and I'm going to start the back part of the book and work back to chapter 1. But in 1 John 5, 13, write that down, 1 John 5, 13, he actually states that he has written that you may know that you have eternal life. That's why he wrote this book, part of why he wrote the book, that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13 actually says this, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, with all that's going on in our society today, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And it's frustrating to not know. (laughs) We don't know when school's going to start back. We don't know when the virus is going to be over. We don't know when things are going to calm down. We don't know when things are going to get back to what we call normal. We don't know when we'll be able to travel the world again. We don't know. We don't know. And I hear that over and over again. We don't know. And even information we're given, we are skeptical of much of that because much of it has been contradictory. Much of it has changed over the process. And our world and world system has lost a great deal of confidence by citizens because sometimes we are given one piece of information on one day, something totally contradictory on another day, and it's just frustrating to not know, is it not? A lot we don't know, but there's some things we can know. And and he says, I have written this book, these five chapters, that you might know that you have eternal life. If you don't know you have eternal life, it isn't God's fault, and it isn't because you can't know. You're going to have to get along with God, and you can know that you have eternal life. You can know if you died, you'd go to heaven. You can know that you've been forgiven. You don't have to hope. You don't, you don't have to hope you can work it all out someday. Maybe I'll make it there. You don't have to live with that sense of question mark regarding eternal life. He gave us this book so that you might know that you have eternal life. That sounds good, doesn't it? A lot we don't know, but we can know that. And I actually, I think about 30 times is the phrase in these five chapters, either I know or you know or we know. About 30 times. That's pretty good, isn't it? There's a lot of no stuff in this, in this text. 
Uh, second key to understanding this, not only is this passage that you may know that you have eternal life, but in 1 John 2, verse 26. 1 John 2, 26. So he wrote this book so that you might not be deceived. That you might not be deceived. In, in chapter 2 and verse 26, he actually states, I have written, there's that phrase again, I have written these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. There were people in that day trying to deceive believers about the legitimacy of who Jesus Christ claimed to be, his deity, his humanity, all of that together. There was a misconstruing teaching about the essence of who God himself is. There was a melting pot of belief systems. Sound familiar? And in our day, it's also very important that you and I not be deceived. Every piece of information, every religious thought does not have validity. Okay? It just does not. Now, I know you and I have, we live in a world where we are multicultural, we're multi-everything. We're in a melting pot society today. And a lot of people believe this, that, and the other. We live in a very religious society culture today. A lot of people are religious, but there is an essence of truth that is absolute in our day. And that essence of truth is found in the Word of God. And we believe the Bible is absolutely true. And even though all of culture, even though Supreme Court, even though all of Congress, even though presidents will come and go, even though all of them and the multitude and, and, and maybe a majority of society might vote on certain things, that certain things are okay, if they are contrary to what God's Word has to say, if you buy into that, you are deceiving yourself into a lie because God Himself established truth and God Himself is light and is truth. There's no deception in Him. So we don't go to what the world has to say regarding what is truth and, and what is light, but we go to what God's word has to say, and that's where we stand. Okay? And the Apostle John, later in life, he said, I wrote this book because there's people trying to deceive you. You'll get sucked in to all kinds of isms and belief systems and religious mindsets and clubs and groups and philosophies of, of thinking. And a lot of it will be attached to spirituality. A lot of it will be attached to God. But don't you believe it? You stick to what God's word has to say. If nobody in the group believes it except you, you stand on that. Okay? So 1 John 5, 13, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's why he wrote the book. 1 John 2, 26, that you may not be deceived. That's why he wrote the book. A third one is 1 John 2, 1, that you might not sin. Whoa. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, My little children, I'm writing, there's that phrase, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. So that you may not sin. So that you may not sin. In case you've forgotten, sin's a bad thing. <laughs> Righteousness is a good thing. Doing right is always good. Doing wrong is always bad, even in the culture in which you and I live. And so, he said, I wrote this book that you might not sin. I'm giving you some warnings in your life that you might not sin. That means that you and I should resist sin. We should resist the temptation to lie, cheat, steal, run around, commit adultery, or, or whatever the issue might be, we should run from things the Bible specifically states as sin. And he said, I've written to you this book as a warning sign to you that you might not sin. Because when you and I enter into that realm of sin, it's destructive. The Bible speaks about sin, that sometimes even the essence of sin can appear like an angel of light. But God is the one who's light, and it may look beautiful on the outside, but in reality, if it's sin, it's going to lead to destruction and turmoil and suck away from your life that which is good. There's a fourth, and it's in our text today, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4. He says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4, we are writing these things. There's that phrase, we are writing. We are writing these things 
so that our joy may be complete. So he wrote this book that your joy may be complete or that it might be full or that it might be abundant. In other words, if you will grasp the teaching of what's in this book, it will help you feel better about life. It will help you have a more joyful, confident spirit and attitude and mindset as you face the challenges in which you face. If you will really dive in and grab hold of what the Apostle John teaches in this book, it will change you from the inside out and it will put a smile on your face and joy in your heart when no one around you has any of that. And they don't have to be laughing for you to laugh. They don't have to be smiling for you to smile. You can be going through the darkest of times and God put joy in your soul if you buy into and embrace the principles of this book. Does all that sound good? So on Monday, you're going to read chapter 1. And on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, and on Thursday, and Friday. And I assure you, we're going to show up next week. And even though you got masks on, I'll be able to see that you're smiling. Because your eyes are going to be squinted. Your cheekbones are going to be raised. Matter of fact, some of you after this week of reading that, even though you're online and I can't even see you, I'll see you through the camera and you're going to be sitting in your recliner with your pajamas on, drinking coffee, and you're going to be smiling from eyeball to eyeball. Now, let's jump into this text. That's an overview of the book. Help you understand it as we teach it over these weeks together. Let me begin reading in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we've observed and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it. And we testify and declare to you the eternal life that, that was with the Father and was revealed to us, what we have seen and heard and also declare to you, so that we may have fellowship, that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things to you that our joy may be complete. Now, this is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in Him. If we say, now we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What a great passage. What a great thought. For the few minutes we have left, I want to talk to you about our enduring faith. Our enduring faith. People are struggling. People of faith are struggling. Pastors, including yours, and people in ministry are struggling. Why? Because we are looking for a sense of certainty that has been taken from us. We are looking for a sense of stability Something that's reliable, something that's trustworthy, something that's enduring and lasting, something that will bring confidence and joy to our journey. And the Apostle John in this text offers two things that we can rely on. And that's what I want to deal with this morning. Number, number one, in this text, John first of all emphasizes the spiritual foundation we stand on. The spiritual foundation we stand on. So much that we deal with right now is not reliable and has no sense of certainty. And he offers us something that is steadfast and unmovable, a solid foundation. Beginning in verse 1 and on through verse 3 is really this focus upon the foundation on which we stand. And he deals with three components of that foundation. First of all, there is an eternal component to that foundation. It, it was built and established long before you and I were ever around. Long before we were ever part, of the, part of, the, uh, of the family of God, the Bible uses the phrase that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. There is a foundation that we cannot comprehend, cannot understand, but our foundation is secure and steadfast, and it's been forever settled in heaven long before you and I were ever around. 
And we can rest on that foundation. When everything else seems to be flimsy and everything else seems to be movable and everything else seems to shift, our foundation is eternal and it's, it's in Christ. He focuses upon the reality of Christ himself being our foundation. In verse 1, he says, what was from the beginning? Literally, he's saying what was even before any of us got here. He's talking about not just on day one, but prior to day one. When the beginning started, this already was. And we know that because in verse 2, when he speaks about the same concept, the last phrase of verse 2, he speaks about we, we declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father. That is before the beginning. This eternal life that was with the Father before the beginning is a direct reference to Jesus Christ himself. He is the essence of our eternity, of our eternal life. Jesus Christ himself is our foundational cornerstone to everything that you and I stand on in our life. As much as I love our nation, as much as I love our flag, as much as I love uh, our history, I love uh, my family, I love my kids, I love my grandkids, I love my heritage, I want you to understand so much of that changes with the wind and changes with time. We see how vulnerable so much of that is and how quickly so much can change right before our very eyes. But our foundation in Jesus Christ is forever settled in heaven and you can live every day of your life until the day you leave this world and that foundation is not going to change. You can rest on it. And that's why it's so important to intentionally guide your heart and guide your mind and guide your thoughts to the Word of God consistently instead of what you and I might hear on the news or what may be the latest tweet or what may be the latest event that happens in society. We've got to keep our heart and our focus just grounded constantly day by day in the Word of God. That spiritual foundation on which we stand has an eternal component. But it also has a historical component. You see in verse 2, the first part of verse 2, it says, it speaks about Jesus Christ, this thing or person that was before the beginning, the word of life. It says that life was revealed. Some translation use the word manifested, made known. That life was made known. That life was manifested. That life was made real to us. Now, we know that is a reference to Jesus Christ because God became flesh and and dwelt among us. Up until Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, there was a mystery that had been passed down through the ages from even Genesis chapter 1 and verse 15 about a Messiah, a deliverer who would someday come. And there was a mystery about who he is, where he's going to be born, what's he going to be like, how will we know when he arrives. But when it uses that term manifested or made known, he's saying we don't live with that sense of mystery anymore because Jesus Christ by this point had already lived among them, had already been crucified for our sins, had already been buried and resurrected from the dead and ascended to the heavenly Father. And the apostle John was there. He was one of the 12. This is the same writer that refers, is referred to in Scripture as John the Beloved, the one who was the closest to Jesus. And he says, historically, I know he lived. <laughs> I remember when he was manifested and made known among us. We look back in history and we can see that Jesus Christ has been manifest and made known. And we've studied him. No other figure in history has been more scrutinized and more studied than than Jesus Christ himself. His claims, all of what others claimed about him. Did he rise from the dead? Was he crucified? What happened during that era? How many people saw him after his resurrection? Uh, Were there people who saw him on his last day? They watched him go into heaven and he said, I'm coming back the way that I have gone. We know historically that's a part of the foundation on which you and I stand. We have 2,000 years of history. We call it church history or history of Jesus Christ coming into this world and we carry on his message. Why would we be interested in sending radios to Cambodia? 
Why would we challenge you to invest in that? Why would we personally invest in that as a church? Because we believe not only Jesus Christ is their only hope, but we believe Jesus Christ is coming again like he said on his last day in which he was here. I'm coming back in like manner. It's a historical component. That life was revealed. You'll notice also part of this spiritual foundation upon which we stand, not only the eternal component, historical component, but there's an experiential component. And I love this. In all three of these first three verses, he uses a similar type of statement, some form of that statement. He says in verse 1, what was from the beginning, and then he uses this phrase, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've observed, and what we've touched with our hands. In verse 2, that life was revealed, and we've seen it, and we testify, and we declare it to you. In verse 3, what we've seen and what we've heard, we also declare to you. Do you see it? Here's what he's saying. I'm not telling you anything I hadn't experienced. Some people wonder, how can I share my faith? How can I share my story? It's because you don't have to make anything up. You don't have to make anything up. You just tell your story. You tell what Jesus Christ has done for you. You tell your journey. You explain his power in and through your life. How do I know he lives? Because he lives within my heart. Amen. You've heard my story. You, you've heard it over and over again about how a little boy, I was eight, he was ten, he walked up to me at a crusade my father was helping organize an evangelistic area-wide outreach and this little boy I never knew I'm playing with he walked up to me at the invitation time and looked over and said Todd have you been saved I said no and he said you don't want to go to hell do you I said no and he walked away and I thought whoo glad he's gone I looked up a couple minutes later and here he came with a preacher and he said Todd here wants to get saved he don't want to go to hell and I gave my life to Jesus as an eight-year-old boy Didn't understand everything there was to know. Still don't know everything there is to know. But I know he came into my life. I remember going to the third grade to my classmates and telling them the next day, after that weekend, I gave my life to Jesus. I got saved this weekend. I remember a month or two later following Christ and believers baptism at Ward's Lake. I can go back through history and I can talk about key spiritual moments in my life. Yes, I can talk about times where I wondered if God existed. Whether God has shown up, I wondered that when my brother died after I prayed. I wondered that after my, my dad died, my mom, dad died, and other challenging issues in my life happened. And I would question, God, are you anywhere around? Yeah, I've gone through those moments too. Y'all all right? But my life, my enduring faith stands firmly, partly on the experiential component of my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I can go back through time and I can tell you about how God supernaturally showed up in my life and took me through certain circumstances or preserved my life or moved on my soul and and gave me new life or breathed new life or direction inside of me. Some of you are there right now. Some of you are in that moment of crisis. You're in that moment of spiritual question where you wonder, God, where are you in all this? Some of you have worked and developed businesses that you're watching uh, unfold and unravel and disappear before your eyes. Others of you are facing great health challenges. You, You have found yourself living in fear. I'm telling you, sometimes we look back in hindsight and when God shows up, it seems like it was just like that. But in reality, usually it was over weeks and months and sometimes years where God made himself known so powerfully in our life. The spiritual foundation upon which we stand, we can continue to stand. A much younger John, hold your hand here in 1 John. He wrote this as he got older, more mature in his life. But in the gospel of John, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the same guy. In the gospel of John, Chapter 1, a much younger John wrote in a similar fashion. And I want to begin in verse 1 of the Gospel of John and read through verse 5. 
and then verse 14. Here's what he said. Very similar to what he wrote in these three verses in 1 John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. And apart from him, nothing, not one thing was created that was created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. A clarifying verse in verse 14, speaking about the word again. The word became flesh, speaking about Jesus Christ, and took up residence among us. And we observed, do you remember that? I've seen it with my eyes. I've heard, it, heard him with my ears. I observed him, that is, literally with my mind. It wasn't simply I glanced at him, but I gazed. I watched him every day. I watched him when life was hard. I watched him when people gave him accolade and how he dealt with praise. I watched him when he dealt with criticism. I watched him when he was run out of town. I watched him when people believed. I watched him when people called him a liar and a fake and a phony. I watched him when they hung him on a cross. And I watched him after he rose from the dead. He observed him. He gazed at him through all the circumstances of life. And as an old man, he was still writing about that solid, firm, spiritual foundation upon which you and I could stand and upon which we can still stand today. Now, that's the spiritual foundation on which we stand. That's our enduring faith. I want to wrap up this morning by talking about the supernatural fellowship we enjoy. The supernatural fellowship we enjoy. That's a part of our enduring faith. The fact that we're in the room today and you folks are taking time to join us online is a part of the supernatural fellowship that we enjoy. We come from different backgrounds and walks of life. I see different races and different colors, and there are people from different parts of our country. There are people in the room from other countries. What brings us together? What brings us together? It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Man, I've traveled the world. I love traveling the world. I miss traveling the world right now. Amen. When I go to another country, it doesn't matter which country that is. If I can find me somebody that knows Jesus, I'm good. <laughs> I have people all the time, aren't you scared to go over there? Aren't you afraid to go over there? Not if I can find me somebody that knows Jesus. And I don't care what race they are. I don't care what language they speak. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care what educational background they may have, what their economic status is. I don't care what kind of car they drive, if they have a car, what kind of house they live in. I'm telling you, I've lived in some places that many people would be afraid to go in. I've lived and I've slept on dirt floors. I've wake, wake, awakened with bug bites and blister bugs that last as long as three months, just whelps on my body. I've been in the Sahara Desert. I've slept on the mud floors, the dirt floors. I've slept with open windows. I've been to all those places. I'm telling you, I feel perfectly at home. If I can just find me one or two people who know Jesus. Amen. That's what the Apostle John is speaking about here. <laughs> There's an essence of fellowship that we enjoy. He goes on to say, beginning in verse 3, he, he infers this. He says, we declare this to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It is here that he speaks about, first of all, the extent of it. The extent of our fellowship. It extends from God the Father, God the Son. We know God the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. And it extends to every heart and life and believer who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's where our fellowship extends. That means it extends beyond Baptist life. Y'all all right? It extends beyond Methodist life, beyond Presbyterian life, beyond Pentecostal life, beyond charismatic life, beyond Catholic life. Whatever brand may be or whatever tradition you may have been brought up in, there may be differences in which we've all been taught and brought into. But I'm just here to tell you, if you show me somebody that says, I know Jesus Christ and my faith and trust is in him, I don't know about you, it just brings me a sense of confidence and stability and enduring faith. And then he goes on 
And not only talks about the extent of it, he talks about the essence of it. Where does it come from? Where does this fellowship come from, this supernatural fellowship come from? Begins in verse 5. He says, now this is the message. This is, doesn't say a message. This is the message. This is the message we heard from him. And now we declare to you. God is light. And there is absolutely no darkness in him. And if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, God is light and in him is no darkness at all is another way of saying God is truth and in him is no deception. Does that help you practically interpret how you and I are to walk? God is truth. The Bible emphasizes truth a lot. You shall know the truth and the truth will do what? The truth will set you free. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. Remember, he wrote this book so you not, might not be deceived. So that you would know truth. You'd be able to discern truth. So practically speaking, if we can learn how to know truth. And we can read and see and experience God's truth. And then apply that truth to our life. Walk in truth. Practice living in truth. Then we're practice, we're practicing living in light. Because when there's lies and deception, we say, I, I need to know the truth. We need to shed some light on this. We need to shed some light on this. We need to understand. And the only way you can understand is to hear and read and know and comprehend truth. So light is impossible without truth. And truth, you can't just pull out of thin air. Truth, you can't just ask people's opinions. Truth, you can't just have polls. Truth, you can't just do a survey. Truth, you have to get into there. Because God's word is truth. Forever settled in heaven. We've been born again, the Bible says. Being born again of the Word of God which lives and abides forever. It goes on to say, All flesh is like grass, and all the glory of man is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever practically here's what I want to leave you with Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 reminds us you were once darkness but now you are light you are light in the Lord so walk as children of light and here's the result he says resulting in goodness Righteousness and truth. That's Ephesians 5 8. So, practically speaking, here's how I want to finish. Just three thoughts. Now, there, it's not stuff you don't know. I, I oftentimes have said the Christian life is not complex. It's not complex. It's not complicated. It really is simple. We're, we're looking for the magic bullet, but it's simple stuff. Number one, intentionally spend time in the Word. Intentionally. Good and better, not going to run you down, jump on your back. Your life's not going to get better <laughs> because good and better ran you down and jumped on you. Your life will get worse because bad and worse will run you down. And jump on your back. Y'all all right? 
So if you expect good and better to find you, you're going to have to intentionally do some stuff. Do the right stuff. So intentionally spend time in the Word. So on Monday, you're going to read chapter 1. On Tuesday, chapter 2. And on Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. Okay. Number two, intentionally talk to God about your life and the world around you. Now, we call this prayer, but I I specifically moved away from that word because it scares some people to do nothing. (laughs) Talk to God. When you have an urge to complain to somebody about something, tell God. (laughs) When, When you have a need to talk about some issue, talk to God. There are old songs that help us with that. You know, just a little talk with Jesus. Take everything to the Lord in prayer. Those are good habits. Intentionally talk to God about your life and the world around you. And finally, intentionally stay connected to other believers. Intentionally stay connected to other believers. Don't allow your life to get so connected to people who aren't followers of Jesus. We have to work to stay connected to unbelievers, to share the gospel, to influence their life. But make sure that you have a deeper connection to devoted followers of Jesus in your life who can influence you in that direction than you do with people who don't know Christ. Make sure. and Don't don't get get in a holy huddle where you, you separate yourself completely from unbelievers. But I'm just telling you, be intentional. Get in a life group. Stay in a life group. If you need to get connected to a life group, we'll help you get connected to a life group. Even right now during these days, we have life groups going on in communities, neighborhoods all around West Georgia and nine different counties here. Okay. If you're online and you're watching online, we can get you connected even to an online life group right now. Just send an email to Leslie at MidwayChurch.com. Leslie at MidwayChurch.com. L-E-S-L-I-E. Church.com. Your dad came this morning, say, I am. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to challenge you with something. If you're watching online, don't tune out just yet. Pause for a second. Some of you have never given your heart and life to Jesus. You've never, you don't know, you don't know that you have eternal life. And today you want to give your heart and life to Christ. While our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, call upon him with me. There's no magical prayer to pray. But if you sense in your spirit God doing something unique, tugging, pulling, a conflict on the inside, just say yes. Move with God. Go in his direction. Pray a prayer something like this. Lord Jesus, today I give you me. Invite you into my life to take over. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Today I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm all yours. Father, thank you for those who've just given their hearts and lives to you. We'll rejoice and celebrate along with heaven as they come into the family of God today. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.